And then they, they lifted me down and they put me in the ambulance. And uh, it was at that point that uh, they, they uh, took my blood pressure. It was through the roof. I bet. And, and they were trying to get an IV in me and they couldn't get an IV in me. My blood pressure, I've, I've got really good blood pressure, but it was, it was up there. And they said they weren't going to take a chance. They were going to airlift me. And I said, just, just drive to Dartmouth, you know. It's only 45, 50 minutes. And they said no. And they, they brought me down the road probably three miles. And uh, Dart picked me up the helicopter. <laughs> everybody to uh, this episode of Northwoods Whitetails. I'm Joey Davis. I'm Isaac Young. I'm John Moulton. All right. Famous so, one and only John Moulton. The f- vacuum. <laughs> the about the that. antler vacuum. The vacuum. Uh, Travis uh, bestowed that term on me. Mm. Well, you found a couple sheds it looks like, so. Yep. 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 Put a lot of time. I've probably got more time into shed hunting than hunting over the years probably do you enjoy it more you think shed hunting or or deer hunting it's i enjoy them both they're just different uh the shed hunting is just it's the catch and release hunting it's the what if it's a little more relaxing i think it is um but it can you know it can lead to yeah i really want to hunt there yeah right yeah um yeah, it's just something I picked up at a real young age, um, and it just goes hand in hand with the with the outdoor lifestyles that I've chose to live. Yeah, so that that kind of brings me into what I wanted to start out with, which is you've been a logger pretty much your whole life. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've been logging for uh, thirty three years now. Um, had uh, my shares of up and downs and uh, hiccups along the way. And um, I got my first job working in the woods, and it was like uh, I just needed a job, and a friend of mine uh, got me hired. And uh, my first job was pulling cable and shoveling trees when the snow was deep in the winter. Um, and I worked hard for that $7 an hour. Yeah, that's that's... It's real work. Yeah, that's real work for sure. You know, um, but it kind of, uh, my grandfather logged, my great-grandfather logged. It kind of skipped a generation. Um, there you and, go. Um, Little mic issue. Here, lift your head up. There you go. Okay. It just uh, it just led to, uh, I said, I think this would really work with, uh, I, it, it, you're outside, you're scouting while you work, and yep. you're you're seeing things that the average person, let's let's put it this way, the average deer hunter, you know, that's got a regular job. How many days a year is he in the woods? Right. Uh, I've got an advantage over some of that just by being out there. Uh, that many more days throughout the year, um, picking up on little things and places to look and. The more time you spend in the woods, the better you're going to see it, right? It always when you when you get back on the snow or whatever it is, it takes a a minute to to adjust your eyes to whatever yeah. it is that you're looking for, right? Yeah. The more time that you spend out there, the better you're going to be picking out what you want. Yeah, exactly. You clue into certain little subtle things that you know it it takes people a long time to pick up on. Um, but it's it's like shed hunting. It's like people say, "Oh, I, I never see a shed in the woods." But w- what are they looking for? I can kind of scan through a piece, and sometimes you pick stuff out from a long ways, and they're like, "Ah, oh, how do you do that?" And mm-hmm. it's just a trained thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Done um, a lot. Done it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, There's a saying that uh, you can't out hunt a logger. Mm, you think that's, that's true, saying. or what? There's a lot of really good hunters uh, that I know that are loggers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, it's a, something that I've noticed ever since I was young. It's like the best deer hunters are usually loggers or foresters, I've noticed too. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, I know some of my mentors, like Charlie Foote, 
you know, there's a guy that logged. Yeah. And uh, if you listen to Charlie, you can learn some stuff. And I did when mm -hmm. I was younger. You know? That's pretty cool. A wealth of knowledge for sure. Absolutely. And he's not afraid to share it. Yeah. And that's another reason, like, doing stuff like this. Let's face it. Uh, it's We should be passing it on. We shouldn't yeah. be keeping it all to ourselves. We really shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, I've got four grown kids, and it's just hunting's not for them. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this is another way of kind of getting it out there. Yeah. So logging is it's a very dangerous occupation. Uh, how many times have you gotten like, seriously hurt doing it? Well, I've gotten seriously hurt twice, and I've had all kinds of bang-ups, close, ups, close you, ones, hiccups. And your, your, how you log, you do it all by hand, right? So yeah, from, um, for the folks listening, when, when, when we say that, that means... Conventional logging is hand-cutting. So I'm hand-cutting the trees, felling, yep. uh, pulling them out with a grapple, uh, with a cable skid and not a grapple. Uh, but that's changed now. So, mm. uh, but that's that's how I did it up until this last year. But yep, I'm not doing it anymore. No. You want to talk about um, what what changed your decision to? Uh... Well, um, I got thumped pretty good. Uh, it happened ten years ago, and uh, it happened again this year. And uh, I was cutting by myself uh, on a lot. And it was my second hitch of the day, so it's about 8.30 in the morning. Um, I went in to cut my second hitch, and I was on, like, the third tree. And I notched a beach, released it, looked up. Everything was clear. And a yellow birch top came out of another tree about 30 feet away. And uh, when it come down, it took my earmuff off my right side on the way by. So, when you want to talk about close calls, this is what a close call is. It's about as close as it gets, wow. huh? And mm. uh, it's, uh, what we think happened is, we think the trees were, sometimes they grow together. Yep. Had a crotch top. Lots yep. of times with that, where I was logging, there's been some ice storms. Those crotches are known, yep. as you, you know. Yep. It's a weak spot. And when I released that beach, it tugged on it, and it was behind me. And when I swung around, looked up, I, I thought I was all clear. I turned and took a couple steps towards the skitter, and it hit me. And like I said, it took the earmuff off, and it come down, and it, it hit my right leg, and uh, it threw me. It, you know, this all happens like a blur. You... You, you kind of reenact it, but you don't know exactly how it happened. But next thing I know, um, I'm laid there in a depression. Depression on the ground. The, yep. And this yellow birch top is laid right across my chest. Holy shit. Right here. It's 12 to 14 inches, the two pieces. Oh, man. And I am in just enough of a depression. It's, it's putting pressure on me, but it's not crushing me. My saw is still running. And uh, I'm trying to figure out, when you get hit, you, you know, it's, it takes a minute to figure out what's going on. Yeah, get all your marbles together. Get all your marbles. So I see my saw still running, and uh, I reach over and grab my saw because these limbs, well, one was in my face and one was pressing down on my hip right here. And, and I had to back cut right towards my face. Yep. I cut a couple limbs off, and I was going to cut the crotch right off. And, uh, and then I got thinking about it. If it's too heavy and I release that, it's going to crush me even more. Mm -hmm. So I said, I better not. And then at that point, I'm starting to wiggle, and I could feel that I could move a little bit. So I shut the saw off. And, you know, you have that feeling. I don't know if you guys have ever had close calls, but you're wondering if this is how it's going to end. And I've had it twice in my life. And this, this time you're talking about was 10 years ago. Uh, You're saying? This, 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 happened. Is oh, this, this is the one yeah. that just happened. This, oh, okay, okay. Is, this just happened. Gotcha. And uh, I look down, and uh, I shut this R off, and I look down, and I'm pointed downhill, and my right leg is completely turned facing north. Oh, oh yeah. 
So I know good. this ain't good. Yeah. And uh, I said, uh, I pulled out my cell phone. But, I mean, I'm kind of thinking. I'm pulling out my cell phone. I'm looking. It's like 8.30, quarter, 9 maybe. I don't remember exactly. But I'm thinking to myself, my wife's not going to know I'm not coming home till 4, 4.30 in the afternoon. Yep. And so it, at that point, she's going to call somebody. But but, how long is it going to take for him to get there? But it's what? 8.30 in the morning? 8.30 in the morning. Yeah. And did you, ha- did you have service? No service. No service. No service. I knew that I didn't have service when I reached for the phone, but I'm just you hoping. Knew, right. I'm just hoping. But did, there's, there's nothing. Did you panic a little bit at that moment, or did you just stay calm? Uh, I hadn't panicked yet, no. but I'm like, this isn't good. Yeah. I got to get myself out of here. I didn't know how bad that leg was and if I was bleeding internal. Or right. I knew that there was multiple compound fractures because your leg does not twist around that way. No, it, it does just, not. It doesn't. Um, so I, is, I, I ended up just kind of pushing on that top and getting myself free. And I remember trying to stand up on my left leg and that leg was just, it was just limp. Oh, man. It's just dangling. Was there pain or no pain? It, that first few minutes, there was no pain. Yep. It's, it's, a, it's a shock. Yeah, mechanism. you're probably in shock. Adrenaline. Yeah, yep, adrenaline. Um, but I, I said to myself, okay, I, I can't stand up and walk this brush. You know, I'm a conventional logger, so it's, it's not perfectly clean there. I got to get to the machine and I got to get myself out of here. So how am I going to do that? So I laid back down and I just started dragging myself. And because it's brush and debris and whatnot, and it wasn't an easy task. I probably had to, to drag myself about 50, 60 feet. And then I get to the skitter and I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to get up in there? There's no bottom step on that machine. They have a rubber step, but it's busted off. So I can't, I can't reach the handles to get in the cab, that 640 John Deere. Yep. It's a big machine. So I'm, I'm looking. I'm laying on the ground, and I'm looking at the tire chain and thinking, I'm going to have to crawl up the tire chain, and then I'm going to have to reach over and, and grab the handle and drag myself in the cab. So that's what I, I first, I started up and then I fell. And that's when the pain really started was when I was trying to get myself into the machine. I think it must have been, I'm going to guess 10 to 15 minutes at that point. And it was wearing off and it was hurt. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to gross people out, but I could feel the bones grinding. Oof in there and it was yeah you know i mean it's tearing my flesh i can feel it it's just it's so awful it's awful yeah but what, what are you gonna, gonna do, do? Yeah. yeah it comes you, with the territory you got it's a, a dangerous job you got will to survive yep then you know it's uh, i've talked to people about this that have been involved in this stuff and it's it's just something that you gotta do you gotta buck up and uh i ended up getting up the tire chain and getting a hold of the handle and then and then pulling myself in but the leg was just flopping and i tried at that point i'm like uh, i thought about uh, like making a splint or something i'm like no this this just isn't working i had my belt off and stuff and i'm like what am i gonna do um so the machine's still running I get in and and I thought for a second. I said, "This is where I got to pay attention. I don't want to do something stupid like get hung up on a stump." Mm-hmm. Yep. Which you can do. It was on steep, <clears throat> fairly steep ground. It's mm-hmm. rocky. Um, so I put the differential lock in, so all four wheels are digging, and I'm looking and I'm like, "I got to get to the height of the land. The height of the land is the only place we had cell phone coverage, and on my log landing, which was out next to a uh, a town road." So you were you were lugging timber uphill. You weren't. No, yeah, I was going. I was probably uh, where this this lot was. It's a it's a hundred and fifty acre lot, and I was probably skidding a, at least a half a mile mm-hmm. on parts of the lot more than that. But I was probably about a half a mile. A half this. a mile. Deep. So the log yard was up from where you were cutting. Up across the top and then back down. Then back down. But you wanted to get to the top to get service. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So. 
I got in there and I, I started driving. I can remember it really hurt. Any little jar and bump oh, and can only imagine. You know man. how machines are. It's, yeah. it's it's not fun. And uh, I remember sweating, you know, and, and just the pain. And I got up uh, I got up to close to the height of the land and I had my phone pulled out and I'm watching it while I'm trying to drive with my left foot. Uh, so I'm running the throttle with the left foot, and I'm kind of hunched up in the cab, and I'm just, I'm just in agony at that point. How long has it been at this point in time? Do you think? I would say 25, 30 minutes. Yep. And uh, I got up to the spot, and a bar popped up, and uh, I did something wrong. I called my wife first. I should have dialed nine one one first, but I called my wife. And then I, I, it could go either way. I, the reason I called my wife is I said, call my friend Mike, who I'm doing the job for, because he's going to know exactly where I am. So I wanted to call her so he could, you know, she could get the call in with Mike. And uh, then I got off the phone, and I, I actually called Mike. I didn't know if he would answer and stuff. And I said, uh, I said I'm hurt bad. And he said, hang up, dial 911, I'm on my way. And he's probably 35, 40 minutes away. Oh, shit. He was there a lot quicker than that. No kidding. Because mm. he, was, he was tuning, getting there. Uh, I dialed 911, I got a hold of him. Uh, the first thing they said to me is, don't move. Which, <laughs> a I got to laugh for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We can laugh about it now. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah. move. If they yeah. could see what I had to go through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was... It well, was... John, can you just crawl out from underneath that log now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would have died if you didn't move, man. Uh, yeah. Jeez. So I'm... So they did. They wanted me to stay still. And then I I, I was feeling sick at that point. Like I, to your stomach? Nauseous. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Nauseous. Pain. And so I sat right there. I shut the machine off. And I shut the machine off so I could hear better because I figured people would be yelling. Um, and, you know, on a logging job, there can be multiple roads. You've cut multiple places. It kind of all looks the same to people. So did you stay on top of that height of land where yep. you had service? You didn't yep. dare go down over the other side, just keep driving the skidder right straight no, to the, the I, helipad. No. Well, what happened is I heard somebody yell, and uh, it ended up being the first EMT to show up. And uh, my friend Mike and Ed came right afterwards, within just a few minutes. And uh, it wasn't that long. I bet you the first person was there. It was probably close to an hour uh, from when the accident happened, a maybe a little bit less. And uh, they said, okay, we got help coming, and uh, we're going to wait for a, for a board or a, a litter to come in here, and we're going to take you out. And so that meant waiting longer. And, and Mike got up in the cab with me because I'm obviously not moving. And he goes, what do you want to do? I said, let's drive the skitter out because I don't know how long it's going to take them to come in here. They're going to have right. to take me out. So uh, we started the skitter back up. I run the throttle with my left foot because I'm all hunched up in there and I've got my leg kind of wedged against the seat over here. And I'm trying to hold it. Uh, but it was brutal, and uh, he steered it, and I ended up driving out, and we got to go up over a rock ledge and some stuff and drop down to land, and I remember driving onto the land, and then there's an ambulance waiting for me there. They had the doors open. There's four or five people there, and uh, I said, uh, they, they got up in, and, and they're asking me, you know, all these questions, and I'm just, it's like, I wanted to get out of there. I just want to go to the hospital or right. whatever. So did they get you out of the skitter at this point? Yeah, they, they were not sure how to do it. Yeah. And finally, they had enough bodies there. They just put the, the backboard up to the base of the floor of the skitter. And I got myself because they were all nervous about how to hold it and stuff. And I just, I swung myself out. It was hard, but I swung myself out. I got on it. And then they, they lifted me down and they put me in the ambulance. And uh, it was at that point that uh, they, they uh, took my blood pressure. It was through the roof. 
I bet. And, and they were trying to get an IV in me, and they couldn't get an IV in me. My blood pressure, I've, I've got really good blood pressure, but it was, it was up there. And they said they weren't going to take a chance. They were going to airlift me. And I said, just, just drive to Dartmouth, you know. It's only 45, 50 minutes. And they said no. And they, they brought me down the road probably three miles. And uh, Dart picked me up with a helicopter and flew me at that point. Uh, they, got, they got meds. They got an IV in me and got some meds on board at that point. And I thought, boy, this is over. This is the worst of it. <laughs> oh, little did I know that when they set your leg, that's a whole nother story. Oh, my yeah, gosh. yeah. Now, what was the date this happened? Uh, September seventh. September seventh. Okay, that'll so, tie back into later. So, so, what was what was it like? Um, you know, was it a stress relief when you saw Dart? You know, land that it, thing. It, what did they land in? They land in the middle of the road, or no? They. They actually uh, routinely have strategic places that they do. So they took me to Sasasimo Lumber in Rumney. Yeah. Right, 118-25 intersection is a big... I, yeah, I know right where you're talking. Yeah, they land right there. That's a place they use often. No kidding. And uh, well, a friend of mine's a manager of the mill there. How long did it take you from there to Dartmouth? Eight minutes. Wow, wow. that's incredible. And if you were to drive around, it would yeah. it would have taken you you know fifty minutes. Yeah, from there. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and what, you know, I remember, I remember getting off the helicopter, landing, and I'm thinking, this is great. This is, but uh, they wheeled me in there, and you know, going through their evaluation and all that, and. It wasn't long afterwards. My wife showed up. She'd driven over. They had called. I might have. Uh, said that they were airlifting me, and so she drove directly over there. So that was good. Um, hmm. But was there was there concern about uh, losing the leg? It was at first because uh, they're telling me stuff. But when you're when you're like that, you're you're not hearing everything and you're listening. But my mm. wife said that they were really worried because there's a thing called compartment syndrome, and that's when you get crushed or a crushing injury. It's really, really bad because it has other effects to the body. And uh, so that's what they were worried about. So um, at that point, uh, they're just drugging me up, and I don't. Right. It was kind of lights were out kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. Until they yeah. pulled on the leg to set it. Oof. So, you woke up quickly. Oh, I never went to sleep. Hmm. I never passed out that hmm. whole time. I really? Never, I never lost consciousness once. Dang. So, so what was the result? Like, I mean... How smashed up was that leg? Well, I had uh, spiral fractures. I had six compound fractures of my tib fib. Um, it was lumped up in, not through the skin, but it was bulging and protruding out the side. Um, and it had uh, done a bunch of tissue damage from me moving and crawling and and because uh, basically when your bones are broken on a spiral fracture, it's sharp, it's jagged. So that stuff's moving in there, it's cutting. and um, So it did some damage, but looking back now, that's what I had to do if I didn't want to lay there all day and take a chance. Yeah, so what, I mean, what did they end up, how many rods do you have in your leg and they, pins and they uh they put one nail they call it a it's a rod down through the the big bone um i forgot how many millimeters long but it's down below my kneecap just above the ankle and it's screwed in uh, four places um it's kind of cool because you can look you can uh, go on the website and i looked it up and it's got a serial number and it's got it's got the length of the screws and <laughs> really, oh yeah, you can. You're look bionic at, man now. Yeah, yeah, I got some. So how long? How long were you in the hospital? Count. So, I think it was. I had yeah. surgery on the second day. They didn't do surgery that day. Just to let the swelling go down first. It, that was one thing, and they were backed up in the ORs with emergencies and other stuff. So they stabilized my leg and they splinted me. They. And they waited. Uh, so it was the night of the second day. I hadn't eaten anything and stuff because I'm waiting for surgery. 
they said, do you feel like eating something? I said, no, I'll try. So they, they brought some food up, put it in front of me, and then somebody yelled, don't let him eat. They've got an opening in the OR, so they took the food away. So <laughs> that made me happy. Yeah. I like to eat. Um, so, uh, but yeah, they went in and uh, the doctor did an amazing job with straightening it out. And uh, um, then we started the, the rehab process. I think I, I came home on the, uh, the fourth day. But what was funny is I was going to stay longer and uh, this occupational therapist come into the room and she goes, how are you doing, Mr. Walton? I said, oh, I'm doing all right. I said, uh, I want to go home. She goes, well, in order to go home, you're going to have to get up on crutches. You're going to have to go out in the hallway, and you're going to have to go upstairs and downstairs and show me that you can do that. I said, can we do it right now because I want to get this over with. So it hurt like hell. You had to walk. <laughs> I had to get up on crutches, hmm. go up to some stairs, and then I had to have a plan coming home, how I was going to get in the house and mm -hmm. stuff. And I told her exactly how I was going to do it. I'm going to tuck and roll. <laughs> One way or another, I'm getting in that house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I came home on the fourth day. Dang. So, so September 12th or 13th, something give or take. Like, something like that. So at this point, you get home. In your mind, were you deer hunting that fall? Yes. You were deer hunting that fall. Do you I, hunt I remember the conversation um, of you being very determined that this wasn't going to slow you down and that you were going to be deer hunting. Yeah. That you you were going to, in your words, you were still going to win the buck pool. Yep. <laughs> you were going to beat Travis. You were going to beat John. You, yeah. you, you were going to win the buck pool. Got to love the confidence. I, I planned on it. Mm -hmm. I really did, but it didn't happen. Well. Uh, but... Uh, I had that mindset that it probably wasn't going to be hunting the way I want to hunt, but I'm going to hunt. Yeah. Uh, they told me after the surgery that he says, uh, I want, I'm going to get you up and we're going to start some physical therapy and you should be able to start putting some weight on it. And, uh, because that's supported with that rod and the screws and stuff. I think that you're going to be able to be walking with crutches here in a few weeks. So that's when I started doing the math. <laughs> yeah. So what have I got to do yeah. at this point? And uh, that's, that's what it was about for me. My wife, I mean, she can tell you, she's like, it's all you're thinking about is deer hunting. Never mind. Right. <laughs> Whatever else you got to go through. Well, um, gave you a good goal. Yeah. I mean, I think it's common now. The yeah. guys that, yeah. that, like us, that are really into it. <sighs> yeah. I mean, we, we all think about deer hunting daily, right? Yeah. yeah. I bet you 99% of guys that would have had that injury would have not deer hunted that fall. I think well, that needs to be said. Well, 99 or better. Uh, I, think it, I think it goes with, you know, John's john's uh, personality who yep. he is right yep. being a logger yep. um the average person is not a logger is not built to be a logger right right um doesn't have the work ethic to be a logger yeah <laughs> takes a certain kind of grit with the same kind of grit it takes to be a good you know tracker yeah. you know that's why i think a lot of loggers are trackers and vice versa so it's mid-september yep. and you're thinking okay i got to do all this stuff. So now take us into like, let's say late October, where were you at? What? Well, well, um, I was in an air cast at that point and I'm on crutches going pretty good. And then I'm just placing my foot on the ground and pretending that I'm walking. Yep. I'm not really putting weight on it, but I'm pretending and I'm doing the motion. I'm bending the knee. The knee had some damage to it and I'm mm -hmm. swelled up and, and of course, you know, when you don't use something, everything seizes up Yeah. and your range of motion and stuff. That's what we're working on, stretching, range of motion, a uh, big part of the PT. So uh, I'm getting out and doing things, and then I'm thinking to myself, there's no reason I can't drive my truck with my left foot. I mean, so I got to the point after a few weeks there that 
I went to Dunkin' Donuts in the morning, got my coffee, and <laughs> <laughs> went out and looked for some deer. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what date it was, but I remember taking my first trip. My wife told me not to, but I did it anyway. So, uh, But at that point, I decided that I'm probably going to be hunting on crutches, you know, for the first part of the deer season. Um, I've always been a big opening day guy, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. You want to get out there. and I'm obviously not going to bow hunt because it's past that. That opened up September 15th and yep. didn't bear hunt. So when muzzleloader was in sight, I remember shooting the muzzleloader on crutches out here. You probably saw the pictures. Um, got my stuff ready. And then I'm thinking, geez, how am I going to lug all this stuff too? Because <laughs> I got crutches. And... Uh, you know, I, I've got the pack and the GoPro and all this stuff. And it's, to be honest, it's a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the first night on, on muzzleloader, I went to sit in the spot. And I said, I know I can't make it far, but it's about 400 yards up there. 400 yards is nothing, right? Well, it took me, <laughs> it took me about 50 minutes to get up there. And I sat on a... a a blown down log in a spot where I'd shot one of those bucks. It's right where I shot one of those bucks tracking a few years ago. And I got to that spot and I said, I'm going to sit right here. And uh, it was, uh, it was hot out, but it was like, it was a goal reach that I actually got in the woods. Um, I took some pictures of my leg up on the log, had my crutches and my, uh, my flannel jacket, my check jacket on the tree over there. So that was that was the beginning. Once I did that, I said, at least I'm out here. I'm in the game, right? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm <coughs> I'm not going to be a tracker this year. It's not going to happen. Um, I thought I did do a little bit before it was over, but uh, at least I was in the game and I was out there. Um, yep. So rifle season rolled around. And you were probably feeling a little better. Mobility yeah. was getting a little better. Yeah, it was. Actually, it was still muzzleloader, and uh, I was sitting in a clear cut, and uh, there was some pretty good deer sign there. And I think the first night I sat there, I'd got up, and uh, my friend John scouted it out, and he said, I think you can get up there, and you can see really good, and, and it's only a couple hundred yards from where you park. And I said, that's, that's what I need. I, I can't get way in there. So I'm going to sit in this clear cut. And the first night I got to that spot, and it was right before dark, and I look up, and I could see a deer walking into the thick stuff. And I said, you know, uh, you know, that's close. It's probably 300 yards away, but at least I saw something. So I said to myself, I said, I'm going to get up further the next the next time I went back. And I, I don't know if it was the next day or a couple of days. Uh, I got up there uh, further, and uh, lo and behold, it had uh, a buck come out. And uh, I had seen I'd seen a flash of a deer and some, some thick whips that had grown up in that cut. And I, I thought I saw an antler. And... Uh, I lost sight of it, and it's thick in there. And then um, I'm watching this open, it rolls off. And then I look down about 10 minutes later, and, and this deer come out to my left, and I look, and it's a four-corn buck. And I'm like, this may be my chance. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I watched him, and then another buck come out right behind him. So there's two small bucks. They looked almost identical. I think one was a three-pointer. Is that the one John Wright shot, or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, I thought about it. I, I thought about it hard. I, I had the scope on that four-pointer. He had come across, and he was probably 150 yards, and he got to about 70 yards in front of me. And I'll be honest with you, I had the gun on him, and at one point I had the safety off. Mm. Temptations. And, and I texted John and I said, I got one out here. And he says, let me know. <laughs> let me know if you're going to shoot. Because yep. he was going to head that way if I shot. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. I would have touched one off. <laughs> yeah, me too. I would have. 100%. Uh, in I the mean, shape you were in? Are you kidding me? I, I wanted to get a deer, but I was like, it just, I don't know. 
I, I held off. And I'm, I'm not known for my patience and holding off. But, yeah, mm. I can hold off on those small bucks normally. But with these conditions, uh, then I was kicking myself. I probably should have shot or yeah. something. But yeah. I just kept plugging away. Um, but it, it, was, it was going slow. I was getting so I could get in the woods maybe a quarter of a mile you know, a few times, but when you, you were feeling more confident, right? Getting into the woods. Yeah, I was feeling more confident. But, but uh, on the other sense of things, and this is this is only because I, I saw the photos, your leg in return was swelling, right? Your oh, yeah. your your ankle was ginormous. Big, bigger than a grapefruit. Oh my god. Yeah. And like Yeah, so all the way up all the way up my leg like, to my calf. I bet it hurt. Oh it did. Yeah. It looked like a <laughs> color of a grape though. I bet. Yeah, it was yeah. big. It's you know that that was with the air cast, and I'd take it off at night, and I'd have to sit up here and elevate it, and I'd get the pillows up, and my wife would get me the ibuprofen and the Tylenol, and and we'd do the ice packs, and the swelling would come back down, and the next day I'd do it again, and between physical therapy and that, I stayed pretty active every day. Mm -hmm. And then there was a couple times I went hunting, and I'm like, I got to rest because it, it, the pain. It got real bad. It got bad. Yeah. It got bad. Um, hmm. Yeah. I can imagine a month and a half earlier, you crushed it. Yep. With a tree. So, yeah. And uh, my buddy called me up and asked, he says, Are you, you coming up to deer camp uh, the first week? And I'm like, um, I'm not coming up. No, I'm not ready. I said, I'm going to shoot for Thanksgiving week because that's when I usually go to camp up in Maine. And uh, I did. So I took off and uh, I went up there that week and it was not fun on snow. I was in the air cast and I'd gone to one crutch instead of using both crutches. So I got to sling my gun most of the time. I got a pack on. I'm running the GoPro. I'm going to film myself, you know, killing a big buck. And I'm like, <laughs> you get you get up these hills and you're slipping and sliding and you got one leg. This one you can't put a ton of weight on. Yeah. And uh, finally I got so I could get the rubber boot on, finally. But that was rugged at the end of the day, trying to get those oh. rubber boots off with the oh, swelling. Oh, my goodness. Cut them off, I would think. So I was Man. back at camp that night. And I couldn't get my boot off. I tried the boot jack, and I couldn't get it off. I had two guys at camp that had to pull oh my, my boot off. Um, Dang. It's, it's either that or stay home. I probably would have slept in my boot on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dump some soapy water down it or something. Oh, yeah. WD-40 I'm just something. thinking one of those real warm days where your foot's soaking uh, wet and you're, you're struggling to get your boot off as it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think, and I didn't get a deer up to Maine. Uh, I hunted that week. And it was Thanksgiving week, and I had to go back and be with the family on Thanksgiving Day. So I hunted, I guess, about four days. And... Uh, I think I was driving back, and I took a picture of my ankle that day, and I had texted it to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that baby was purple. Yeah, yeah. Dang. So at that point, I said, "Well, I'm going to concentrate and go home on New Hampshire after Thanksgiving." And so, when it got down to about a week to go in New Hampshire, I'm like, uh, "I got to hit it hard." Yep. And. Uh, I got to try something different. I got to go to a different type spot. I can't hunt where I've always hunted just because of conditions. So I picked a spot that I had hunted years and years ago that had a good access with a power line. And uh, I went up there and uh, a buddy of mine uh, went to and I told him, I said, Jesus, some good sign here. This is really good. And can I say something real quick? Yeah. I think this last fall could have been the best year to not be mobile because the deer were all super low they you're right you they, know? they were they were hitting the green uh they were in the open cuts feeding yeah yep. uh, they were in those spots that were more visible you know than most other years yeah so so there was uh i went up this power line and there was some rubs and scrapes right there and I said this is this is good and I I found a pretty good run coming out and uh, I said I'm gonna go up here and sit 
uh, the next night. So I went up there and sat, and uh, I don't know, about a half an hour before dark. And I looked down, and uh, here comes this buck out. Uh, I, and then I saw another deer. There was a doe in front of it I didn't see that come out. And this buck come out, and I lost sight of him. And, and you know in those contour spots where you see a deer, then you don't see a deer, then they disappear, and you're wondering, where did he go? Where did he go? So I'm right on full alert, you know. And then all of a sudden I see the doe go flying back into the woods, and then here's the buck again. So I, I'm swinging on a running deer, and I'm shooting. I'm going to take a shot. I mean, this may be it. And uh, I touched off, and and uh, I thought he f he flinched. It acted like a hit. Uh, so I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, this could be good. So I waited for a few minutes, and then I uh, got my stuff rounded up. I got my pack out, and I've, you know, I can't move quite as fast as I normally. You can run right down there. Yep. There was only about 15 minutes of light left. Um, so I run down there, and. Uh, and I look, and uh, I found the track where it went in the woods off the power line. And I did find one little tuft of white hair, which uh, sometimes you just see deer hair, yeah. too. You don't always yeah. know. Uh, by then, it's soon as you got in the wood line, it's dark when you step in the woods, you know. Um, so I said to, uh, I got I got to leave. I can't be looking around in here. So uh I got down where I had coverage, and I texted my, my buddy that had gone up there uh, a few days before, and I said, uh, you want to go up there and help me look in the morning? And he goes, absolutely. I said, uh, I'm not going to rush right up there too, too early. I said, uh, why don't you go up there and sit? And I told him exactly where to sit. And he's a young guy, and he's a really good, really good guy, and he's learning a lot about hunting and and uh, so he said, I'll get up there before daylight. Um, so I'm, I don't know, it's probably half, half an hour, 45 minutes after light, and I'm headed up there, and I'm in my truck and stuff, and I got a text from him that he just shot one. No he kidding. Got one. That's so awesome. It came out on the run that I said was going to come out right there. Really? It was about, uh, it was within 50 yards where I'd shot at the one uh, the night before, so... That's pretty cool. Uh, I got up there. He's down, got his gun in the truck, and and I'm like, this is awesome. And he grabbed the jet sled, and we went up and looked, and, of course, found blood right away. And it took us a little bit. And uh, then he realized that he hadn't gone in the woods and looked, but the deer wasn't dead. The deer jumped up. I said, go down and get your gun. At first, I gave him my gun. He goes, oh. I said, you better go down and get your gun. I'm just going to sit right here. He went down and got his gun. We went in the woods there, and he didn't go 50, 75 yards, and the deer jumped up, and he shot it, and it was done. Um, but at that point, he tagged the buck. It was a, it was a spike horn, but he was happy. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. No, nope. no. Nope. And it, I like, that's something I want to stress. If it makes you happy, yeah, absolutely. And you're a meat hunter. Yep, I'm all for it. Yeah. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Nope. If it makes your heart pound, yeah, you should be pulling the trigger. Yeah, oh, right. a lot of squirrels make my heart pound. So <laughs> if, it's, if it doesn't, <laughs> shoot a lot of squirrels. If it doesn't get you excited, right? No. That's your indicator. Then you don't yeah. shoot. Yeah, right. You know, on those crunchy days though, and you get that weird feeling, and you're. And you're like, yeah. oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it's the old gray squirrel popping out of, yeah, you know, they get me. So at that point, uh, uh, let me actually back up. I forgot one little part. So there was a blood trail where he'd shot the buck, and he went down and got the gun. And uh, I waited for him to come back up, and I didn't go ten feet on that blood trail. And there's a matching set of deer antlers. Come on, of course, the vacuum. That were side by side. They were chewed up. They'd been there for about three years. <laughs> huh? Big was, set? Or? No, it was a medium set. Okay. But there was a couple old apple trees. Do right you think there. he's going to tell you if it was a big <laughs> set, anyways? <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but so it was kind of cool. So we he got that deer. We tagged it. We had the set of sheds there, and I said, okay. Uh, 
the truck's only a couple hundred yards down there. And uh, I said, let's go up here and, and look where I shot the buck last night. And so we went up there. And we got on the track. We followed it in. We didn't see any signs of a hit, any blood. And so what we did is uh, we you can only follow a deer track in leaves so long. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's wet or if it's got some contour or something, it's much easier. But you get a deer on flat ground, you're not going to follow it only so long. Especially so, if it stops running. Right, exactly. So uh, at that point, uh, I started uh, doing little grids, and he he can get around good. So we did grids there for like two and a half, three hours, and we kept going further. And we couldn't find any signs of a hit. And uh, so I chalked it up to I missed. Um, And I I figured that was going to be my one shot for the year, Um, and it was over with, but... Do you, what was the deer that you'd shot at? Do you know? To have a rack? Was it was it, a rack buck. Yeah. It wasn't a huge buck, yeah. but it was a rack buck. You know, it was, a, it was probably an eight pointer. Yeah. I couldn't tell you how big, but I was shooting. Big yeah. enough. It yeah. was big enough. Big for enough. Me. Yeah. That's what I say. It was big enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I kept hunting. I went back to that spot, and uh, every day I kept going further and further. And uh, I actually hunted probably, I probably got up there about a mile, and then I started swinging in the woods, and I found some pretty good deer sign up there. And by this time, we're down to uh, only three days left of the season. I think that was on like a Friday I hunted up there. So Saturday, I rested up that night, and then Saturday I said, I'm going to go back to that area, and I'm going to go up where I found all those rubs and scrapes. We had a little bit of snow up there in elevation, but it was a very wet snow, and it was the type when you got in the hemlocks or the spruce, you lost it. Mm-hmm. It was more out in the hardwoods. It stayed the, in the canopy. Yeah. stayed above the canopy. So uh, I decided I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to get as high as I can get, and I'm going to hunt my way down. So uh, I booked it right up there, and I probably so this is Saturday. The season ends on Sunday. And I get up there probably about a mile and a half, two miles, made a swing in the woods, and I got on two deer tracks. And it was a doe and a skipper track, I'm pretty sure. But I said, you know what? I'm going to follow them. You know, it's Mm -hmm. deer lead to deer. It's just been my experience in the past. If if you want to try to track and you've got nothing around and you've got a a doe track, you might as well see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because you never know when a buck's going to come in on them or scent check them or, mm-hmm. or... Or they take you into a barnyard where there's yeah. a buck running another. It's great advice. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So I, I, I followed it and followed it. And it, it's that snow coming off the trees. It's wet and rainy. And I'm like, I'm tracking. There's, there's two days left of the season. I'm tracking. And I get up in there and uh, they go into a cut. And I'm telling you, this cut is a wall. You know how they grow back with that beach that's, if you put your head down and run real hard, you might get two feet into mm-hmm. it? Yeah. It's one of those. And yeah. I'm yeah. like, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not on crutches now, but I'm limping hard. And I said, I'm just going to swing the edge of this cut. So I went around. Uh, I made it about a third of the way around, and I found their track coming out. And I went a little bit further, and then another track had come down off the hill and got in with them. And I said, uh, I said, I think that's a small buck. It had come off the hill. And I got following, and it walked right by some rubs. It didn't rub, but it walked by some. And uh, I followed that for probably another half a mile or something. And it went into a cutoff area. And uh, I jumped a moose up. And uh, that got my heart going for a minute because, yeah. you know, you're on full alert. And, yeah. and, and all of a sudden it jumped up and it was a rack moose. And you, yeah. could, you could hear the antlers ticking out through the woods. That's yeah. I look for sheds. And when you hear antlers ticking oh, off yeah. that, that really, you know. So um, I, I kept going and I ended up spending, I don't know, it was about noontime, I think. 
and I'm looking down and I'm getting pretty tired and I'm thinking to myself, they kept going up. And I'm like, my truck's back two, at this point, two miles, maybe a little bit more. And uh, I'm looking at my app on my phone and I've been almost six miles. I forgot how many steps, but I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it. I'm getting pretty tired and I'm said, maybe I just need to head back to the truck uh, get some dry clothes and go sit someplace for the last hour or two. So I, I headed out there and, uh, and I'm thinking all the way, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, uh, I got home here and I got some dry clothes on. Lisa says, my wife says, what are you doing? And I said, I think I'm going to go down and sit. My buddy Travis had told me a spot that was easy to get to. And I only had to walk about 100 yards, and I could sit. And it's got a good vantage point of a green field that's you can't see from the road, and the field rolls off. And that's what we like, because we know that deer like those hidden edges. And and uh, so I said, I'm going to run down there where Travis showed me to go. And by this time, it's, I think it's like 2.30. I get down there, and uh, I get out of the truck, and I... I said, I'm not taking the pack and the GoPro and all that stuff. I'm just sick of carrying that all day. And I carried it all morning and took videos and stuff. And I said, to hell with that. So I literally went down across this field with my gun, my magazine, uh, you know, my bullets. And uh, I think I had my grunt tube on me. That's it. And I went down there because I got my cell phone on me. And I got down there and I looked and I and uh, looking at legal shooting time and I had exactly an hour left. And I'm like, okay, this is sad day. I got one day left. Where am I going to go tomorrow? What am I going to do? I don't want to give up. I'm not. I'm not a quitter type person. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, listeners. Most people uh, are rolled yeah. over at this point. Yeah, yeah for sure. I'm going to ride it out. So I'm. I'm thinking to myself. I. I get down there and I. I go to where I'm going to sit, and there's this, these rocks, and there's a few trees right there, and I'm looking down across this field, and I can see a, a field off to my right there. So I'm kind of looking all around, and I said, you know, this would be a nice time to just have one come out here and, and uh, get this thing done. And, and I'm sitting there for about 15 or 20 minutes, and I'm looking over my shoulder, and I turn back around, and I'm like, there's a deer 50 yards in the field already. I'm like, where did he come from? I swear I just looked over there like of 30 seconds ago. But you know how quick it can happen. And I look and I said, geez, it looks like it's got a rack on it. And I pull the gun up and I said, damn, it's, it's got antlers. And, I, and it, it was walking, quartering kind of away. And it's about 80 or 90 yards and I, I remember thinking to myself, I'm shooting this deer. So I just pulled up. I took a couple breaths, and it was 90, 100 yards, and I just touched off, and the thing just hit the dirt. No kidding. Just like somebody <laughs> flicked a light switch. Yeah. Huh. So, so I'm like, that, that just goes to show you, you know, deer hunting can go zero to 100. It's going to happen when you least expect it. Yeah. And... Uh, it just, I just couldn't believe it happened, to tell you the truth. So yeah. the first thing I do is I call Travis. And I'm like, buck down. And he's like, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I said, I'm going to need help. I can't do this. <laughs> I said, I got the jet sled in the truck. And he's, or no, he said, I'm going to bring the jet sled. I said, no, I already got one in the truck. He says, I'm getting stuff. I'll be there in 10 minutes, he says. <laughs> and it was about Eight minutes later, I could hear the truck hammering <laughs> up the road. And uh, at this time, I'd walk down to the deer, and, and I'm looking at the deer, and, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm happy. You know, it yeah. isn't always, we're not all going to shoot a big, huge buck every year. We want to. Right. It doesn't always happen. That's not reality. Well, especially not when your leg's mangled. Right. That's right. the moral of the whole story here, that um, you persevered. Yeah, I mean... There's a seven-pointer right up there. That's him, and he is 16 inches wide. He dressed 151 pounds. Yep. 
I was happy to put my tag on him. Yeah. You know? Heck yeah. Um, it's an incredible story. And uh, thank <laughs> God for Travis coming because I couldn't have drug him up out of there alone. <laughs> um, but it, it was fun. It was fun. That's, and that's the other thing is deer hunting, you should be happy when your friends are getting deer. I love it when my friends get deer. He was happy that I got the deer. Um, that's what it's all about. I think uh, too many people probably lose sight of that. Um, mm-hmm. I think know. we're all guilty of it sometimes, right? Like we all want to get a deer. I mean, the day that I killed my New Hampshire buck, I was like, I just got to hunt for the hunt. Like take yep. the pressure off and just yeah, just go after it, right? Yeah. And it happened that day. Don't you think um, when you just said taking the pressure off, I didn't put any pressure on myself this year. I mean, I pushed myself, but I didn't mm-hmm. put any pressure. I figured I've gotten a deer somewhere in some state every year for the last 30 years. I've always gotten a deer, whether it be Maine, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. I, I mean, I've hunted a lot of places in Anacosti and Saskatchewan. Um, I've been to the Midwest, but I wanted to get a deer. Mm-hmm. And getting a deer in New Hampshire, that was, you know, that was Your the ice. State. That's my home state. That was icing on the cake. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I think we all put unnecessary pressure on ourselves, right? Like for me this year, it was just trying to find a big track and kill a big buck, right? Yeah. Just like everybody else that hunts the north, just could not find a big track, right? Yeah. And right. we're just scrambling, packing miles on, and it gets frustrating and frustrating. Yeah. And you put more and more pressure on yourself, right? And at some point in time, you have to realize to take that pressure off. Right. Just have a good time and enjoy and it. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, um, I think this made me think a little bit more what it's really about, too. I've, I've put pressure on myself in the past, and you shouldn't. Uh, trying to kill that big deer and stuff. It's, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, it's going to happen the way that it's meant to happen. Put the sure. work in. Put the work in. Have a good time. Have fun with your friends. And the rest will sort itself out. Yep. That's that's key. Yep. Yep. So Stay persistent, up. patient. Yeah. It's going to happen. the last day. So yep. that buck didn't win the deer pool, though. <laughs> No, but I think you want it effort-wise. Yeah, same. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. Um, yeah. I'm happy, but um, the leg is 80%. It's pretty good. Um, I'm not really sure. I don't think it's ever going to be 100%, but it's not going to stop me. I think I'm going to I'm gonna shoot a big deer this year. That's mm. – I'm going to try anyways. Yeah. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. We'll see. I'll put the work in anyway, so let's put it that way. Yep. That's all we can ask for. Oh, man. That was a story. That's a pretty good story, John. It's pretty good. It is. It's It's who you are, though. Yeah, that's that's the thing. That's kind of what I wanted to touch on this whole story is, you know, the fact that you could have a, you know, potentially life-threatening injury like that, and then a month and a half later you're back in the woods hunting. It just kind of shows a lot about you. Yeah. You know, I you think know, that's why you've been uh, successful throughout I mean, your life. Just your character, yeah, too, yeah, right? Like who yeah. who you are. I mean, loggers, farmers are probably the hardest working people that I know, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. and and that goes to show, like, you had a goal in mind that you wanted to accomplish, and and you you didn't give up on it, right? right. You could have given up when that tree was across your chest, and you didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean. Uh, it's a it's a it's a learning experience too. It's a it's a gut check as they call it. Yeah. You know. Puts things in perspective, I'm sure. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. How um, big's a buck you're gonna kill in twenty twenty three? Without putting pressure on myself, well, I don't know if I'm going for two. I'll 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 shoot for a solid 180, 190 pound buck. Okay. With a decent rack. Not too shabby. I'm not passing that up. No. As long as you kill a bigger buck than the guys that are sitting here at this table than with us right <laughs> now, then well, you're good to go. Yeah, I, I got some payback. So Travis won the deer pool this year. <laughs> He's not taking that money this year. <laughs> He's not. So we'll see. Cool, man. 
Oh, this was a good one. Yeah, yeah. You got anything else? That's it. Dang. It's yep. a good one. Thanks, John. Right, guys. Appreciate it. Thank See you. See you on the next one.